You call yourself an optimist, don't you? Definitely. You see the light in the future. There's always a bright side. Yeah. Are you a doomsday prepper? You know I keep tins of beans. You have a bunker. It's not a bunker, it's a garage, but it does have a lot of beans in it. Close yeah. enough. I'm not a doomer. I'm not a nihilist either, but there are people out there who think that AI specifically is like step one on a board and step five is the end of humanity as anyone has ever known it. And there aren't really that many steps between one and five. It still feels really far off. I don't know how seriously people are taking some of those concerns. I think we should find out. Among the most controversial expectations of AI is that humanity itself could be eradicated as a result of machines becoming immeasurably smarter than us and wildly misaligned with our values. It's an extreme belief with no shortage of vocal critics. Elise Yudkowsky is a notable member of the group of AI commentators adamant, though, in their belief that there's very little hope for humanity's survival short of brute force intervention. To understand the backlash to the belief, we wanted to hear from someone who swears by it. Eliza Yudkowsky, thank you so much for joining us. You're a researcher, writer, philosopher, and some would call you an AI doomer. <laughs> what are your thoughts on artificial intelligence and where we are right now? Where we are right now is exciting. Where we are heading is a lot more important than that, I'd say. We've you know, been going from GPT-2 to GPT-3 to GPT-4. GPT-4 is kind of when it became obvious to a lot of people that this was going somewhere interesting. It got a little further than I expected it to get. And what becomes of GPT-5, GPT-6, GPT-7? Uh, even if that technology stalls out, what happens about the next wave of technologies? I think it gets smarter than us. I think we're not ready. I think we don't know what we're doing. And I think we're all going to die. There's the doomer that we heard about. <laughs> what are the main trends that you're seeing right now that pointers in either a positive direction or in a negative direction? Like, is there something happening where, you know, this is going well, this could be what we need in order to get out of this potential downward spiral, or is it far outweighed by another negative development? So I think the, the basic factor here is that capabilities, how smart these things are, has been running way ahead of progress in understanding how they work, and being able to shape their behavior in detail, robustly, in a way that you know holds up under pressure. Um, the, the state of affairs is that we, we approximately have no idea what's going on inside GPT-4. We have theories, but no ability to actually look at the enormous matrices of fractional numbers being multiplied and added in there and be, what do those numbers mean? We approximately have no idea. People are working on it, it's important. If humanity was at all sensible, we'd be pouring $100 billion a year into figuring out what's going on in there. Um, and, but the, the few people working on it um, are not making progress at a rate where even if we put half the graduating physicists on this, I would have very much confidence that we'd know what was going on in there in three years, five years. Um, so that, that, that's, the, like, that's the basic trend, I think. We've had some prominent voices in the AI community come out and ask for a pause on building AI technology as fast as we are right now. On the one hand, if we do slow down, does it give our adversaries or other bad actors a chance to catch up or even get ahead of us? Um, but how do you think about the race in artificial intelligence and specifically AGI and the competing priority of aligning it to human values or falling behind? What do you think is more important? I think that nobody wins an AI arms race except the AI. Um, I think that we need international coordination as opposed to just local action around putting a cap somewhere around present capability levels, no training runs larger than GPT-4 because once you've trained an AI, which is the huge expensive part, it exists and it can be run on much smaller computers than the giant clusters created to train them. So, if you want there to be any kind of slowdown, and, or rather halt, preferably, it has to be at the level of when you train it, because that's the part that it takes enormous resources that can be detected, that could potentially be monitored. And I think that this is a situation where, from my perspective, the, the, the small hope of survival, such as there is, is that the United States and China 
cooperate on this because neither of us want to die. Um, right now, the US and UK are in the lead and a unilateral slowdown by the US and UK would temporarily be effective and would maybe help to impress the gravity of the situation on China. But ultimately, this is a situation where the US and UK and China and the places that manufacture GPUs and all the, you know, all the, all the GPUs we would want to track, we would want to be able to know where all the data centers are. We would want all the data centers monitored by an international authority to make sure that AIs were not being trained to be too large. If we actually wanted to, to slow down or stop or not die here, it would be quite difficult. Walk us through your, your argument behind why misaligned artificial intelligence will actually lead to the destruction of humanity. Maybe I'm missing something there. Well, if it's smarter than us and we don't understand it and we couldn't shape it, and it ended up with the sort of weird desires that things that I would predict that things get when you trade them by gradient descent, which is something of a more technical story. But you know, the, 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 the view from a thousand feet is that when you're trying something for the first time, things sometimes go wrong. It ends up wanting weird stuff. Most weird things you can want imply using lots of resources, doing lots of computation, not having humans interfere with you. And if something is very, very smart, it probably gets what it wants, even if we want something different. I can try to zoom in on possible ways that something much, much smarter than us might defeat us in a fight if it came to that, but I wouldn't be able to guess it accurately for the same reason that the 11th century would not be able to call how the 21st century would roll over them militarily if it came to a fight across a thousand years. For the same reason that if you were playing chess against the best modern AI chess players, much, much better than you, but I couldn't tell you, the AI is going to move here. It will defeat using this tactic. If I could predict the AI playing that well, I'd be that smart at chess myself. I could just move wherever I predicted the AI would move. So I can try to put lower bounds on how badly we would lose a fight against something much smarter than us. I can observe, for example, that um, AlphaFold 2 has, got, has basically cracked the problem of predicting protein structure from DNA sequences, which is one of the keystone abilities you need to synthesize your own artificial life forms. If I was going deeper into that conversation, I could talk about how proteins themselves are fold up and are hand, held together by van der Waals forces, basically by static cling, and how this is um, those are weaker forces. It's why your hand isn't as strong as steel, as strong as concrete. It's not that life is inherently squishy. It's that it's made out of squishy materials. Stronger ways to put life together. Things like bacteria with a hundred times the, the strength and power density of the bacteria we know. We would lose that fight very badly. It would probably not inform us that a fight was going on until we were, had already lost, essentially. That is what happens when you go up against something smarter than you. But that's, I mean, there's such a big, there's such a big gap between predicting the protein structures of, you know, 200 million proteins and a synthetic life form being created that poses a threat to us. Like, what is the transition between those two things? Additional brain work that an AI might be able to do very, very fast if it was smarter and faster than us. When you, when you hear the word AI, think maybe of an entire alien civilization contained in a box, running at a million times human speed. Also, the aliens are smarter than us. So you, you, there, there is indeed a gap between predicting the structure of proteins from existing DNA and predicting the chemical impact of those proteins, predicting what they do, how they interact, and going from what you want the protein to do chemically to figure out what is a DNA sequence that will make a protein like that. But these are gaps of the kind that humanity would cross given, you know, 50 years, 20 years, 100 years to work on it. So if you think much faster, if you can arrive at the same conclusions using less evidence because you are smarter, then I think that something smarter and faster than us crosses that gap much more quickly. It might need to make its own little laboratory to figure all the stuff out. But again, that's a mental problem. 
can mentally solve, of building that tiny laboratory to do the science quickly, high speed. With building anything, there's trial and error, and technology has progressed because we build, we tune, we tweak, and fine tune, but we don't know what to fine tune until we build it. And I think one of the points that you've made is that we won't get a chance for a redo if we don't get the alignment problem right. Why do you think that? Well, if you're trying to align something smarter than yourself, well, first of all, if it's not already aligned, it had better be stupider than you at that point. Back when they were first building nuclear weapons, there was a concern, what if it ignites the atmosphere? What if we start the nitrogen atoms in the atmosphere fusing together, generating more energy, heats them up further? Well, they did, ran the calculations. It looked really, really unlikely with enormous error margins. But, you know, it was important to get that calculation right because getting that calculation wrong means that the atmosphere gets ignited and everybody on Earth dies. And what we have with AI is same kind of thing, except that there's no design for safety, no calculation that tells us that we're safe, no way to calculate when it gets big enough to metaphorically ignite the atmosphere. We're, we're going in blind. And at some point you say, you know, this is a bad idea and we should not do it. What are your thoughts on Jeff Hinton leaving Google? After many, many years watching these concerns casually dismissed, not taken seriously, suddenly ChatGPT and GPT-4 have been enough to wake people up. And people are doing things like, like leaving Google so they can speak freely on the topic. It's better than I was expecting things to go. I'm not sure it's good enough. How screwed are we if we don't do something? I mean, if we don't do something more? I mean, unless we do a whole lot more, more, more than I'm actually expecting to happen, I think we, we see the company is continuing to charge ahead. I think we, we see them continuing to build smarter and smarter things. I think that warning signs appear. I think they go ahead anyways. I think people talk about regulatory regimes. I think there is no actually effective international regime that caps everything, that, that calls a halt at any point. So people keep going. The algorithms get better. You need fewer GPUs to train things. They get smarter, they get smarter. Warning signs appear. People keep going because, you know, if we don't, somebody else will. And then everybody falls over dead, more or less. And what, what's the next warning sign then that, that, we, that we look out for? Yeah, it is easier to predict where this all ends up than the ex exact pathway we take to get there. As far as I know, nobody has a good track record of calling the next thing. We went from GPT-3 to GPT-4, and so far as I've ever heard, nobody wrote down in advance a set of predictions for what GPT-4 would become able to do that stopped GPT-3 flat. Uh, they did predict like numerical measures, like the predictive loss on, on, the, on the text it was being trained on. They called that very precisely, but what does that correspond to? What can it actually do? As far as I know, nobody wrote down an advanced prediction about that. So maybe the, maybe the next big thing is AI is getting better at coding to the point where they can find bugs in software. And the great internet apocalypse of AIs finding lots and lots of bugs and lots and lots of stuff interfacing the internet and people vandalizing that before it all gets fixed. Or you could conversely tell the story of, you know, maybe somebody uses that capability a bit more responsibly and tries to fix all the software on the internet before AIs can melt it all down. Though this is very not much not the way things have been going in computer security so far. Um, or it could be something completely different. Maybe the next big thing is millions of people dropping out of human society, human romantic relationships, because the AI fake relationship software got sufficiently good that, you know, not all relationships fell apart, but like 20% of them, maybe like 20% of, of people break up next year because of AI super relationships. But, but, you know, calling this is really hard. I can spin stories. To actually know what would happen, I would need to know which AI capabilities come next. And as far as I know, nobody's got a good predictive track record on that, which is part of the problem here. It seems like there is a fascination with thinking about the doomsday scenario in a way that almost feels dismissive. Like, it's so far out into the future that it just can't possibly be real. But there's also very real fears, like the one that you hold, about what artificial intelligence could mean for the future of humanity. How do we start to get people to take this seriously? 
Well, I've sure been trying that for a couple of decades, and as far as I can tell, the only thing that ever worked was <laughs> Bing Sydney actually coming out, Chat GPT actually coming out. People were like, oh, okay, this is not a movie. This is real. This is starting to happen. Some people were like, oh, well, this thing is clearly not smart enough to kill everybody yet, therefore that can never happen. You know, it's not, it's not actually obvious to me that the way this plays out is that people just never notice, right? <laughs> like, people are already starting to notice. This, uh, you know, this, this, would not, this interview would not have happened 20 years ago, uh, even though some of us were claiming 20 years ago that it was kind of predictable we'd all end up here at some point. Maybe not 20 years exactly, but at some point. At some point, we would be in this massive panic about not being prepared. And we tried, we tried to have, it, people, have people be more prepared earlier than this. We tried to have there not be a last minute rush. We utterly failed. And here we are, <laughs> you know, and, but, but maybe we can turn around. We learn a lot by almost killing ourselves and then preventing it. And I think about like inventing cars and dying. So we invent seat belts and then safer traffic so, systems. Madame Curie, you know, got herself killed discovering that the glowing rocks were dangerous in, in the true service of humanity, martyr to humanity. And the thing is, is that individual humans die and humanity learns and goes on. If you're dealing with something that can kill off all of humanity the same way you can, that, the same way that individual humans can die, in car crashes. It, it takes a different level of caution. It would be like if you were, you know, a few thousand years old and immortal, and, but you want it to keep going, right? We want humanity to keep going. Don't, we don't think humanity is old enough at a few tens of thousands of years. We'd like humanity to keep going. That takes a different level of caution. It's the kind of caution you need if, if as an individual, you wanted to, you know, who didn't age, you wanted to not die. And the factor that I'm, in all the places of human technology where mistakes will not wipe out the human species, I'm in favor of trying things, stumbling, picking ourselves up, learning, moving on. When it comes to artificial intelligence or gain of function research in biology, though it's not as urgent in biology, but you know, it's still not great. Those are places where you, you have a little boo boo and maybe there's nobody around to learn from it because everybody's dead. And yeah, that's, that I think is a different and special case. You, we want to build nuclear power plants and have some, some of them melt down? I personally am all in favor of that. You know, it's, it's not the same issue, but my personal politics happen to be build more nuclear power plants. Humanity will survive if one of them melts down. AI is not like that. How do you know if we've hit the point of no return? Well, if you're all still alive, you haven't hit the point of no return. Where there's life, there's hope. Um, a, 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 so there but, is hope. There is hope then. Well, yeah, we could all wake up tomorrow and decide to not do this. It's not a lot of hope, but it's, but you know, I'm, I'm not willing to say it for, I'm not willing to just decide by myself that humanity will commit suicide about this. It's not my place we can, to decide. We can about. add AI hopeful doomer to your title next time. There's, there's always hope. There isn't always very much hope, but there's always hope. And in a sense, it's all we have. I've always, believed, I say always, since I've been thinking about this in great detail, I've believed that if the human brain was a product, no one would ever be allowed to sell it. But partly because I think that with that, you would then want to sell it arms and legs and accessories and things. And, and that's where the problems begin. But the brain in and of itself isn't going to change the world. And I just wonder now if that is too naive, because the brain is not connected to every other brain on the planet. Um, Right, it needs more, and it's it, in isolation. Yeah, it's not quite as dangerous or as useful. And I guess the problem is this isn't in isolation. This is what you're saying. Like it's connected to the internet. It is developing. In that sense, it is the brain that's been given arms and given legs. It's just they are figurative and they are electronic. Is that a fair way of thinking about this, or am I completely nuts? I mean, even if we were air gapping the AI, even if we're not connected to the internet, I would be worried about it being in contact with the humans. I would worry that the humans are not secure software and that the AI can hack the humans, either metaphorically in a, in a way that would be understandable to us as ordinary conversation or a way where we would look at the conversation and even afterwards not be able to figure out what exactly happened. Um, there, there's a way I sometimes explain the difficulty of going up against something smarter than you, which is that if you sent a design for an air conditioner 
back to the 11th century, and it was in enough detail they could actually be, build an air conditioner, they'd be surprised when cold air came out because the air conditioner is using a law of nature, the relationship between temperature and pressure that they didn't know about a thousand years ago. So what is magic? If you have the word magic, meaning anything at all, it describes something that uses a law of nature you don't know about such that you can see exactly what they did and still not understand what happened afterwards. It's a step up from how you'd lose a chess game against the best modern chess computers, where you can at least understand the rules that they used against you. The, the, the less you understand something, the more likely it is that something smarter than you can do something in that domain that is magic. And we understand the human brain very poorly. How exactly does hypnosis work? Nobody knows, as far as I know. You've been hypnotized. It didn't work, though. Yeah. But maybe there's a version of that that works more reliably. And that's just like a case where we know that there's something we don't know. So something much, much smarter than us, where is it likely to be able to use magic against us? Well, several places, but one of them is the brain, because we understand that very poorly. Might be able to do stuff where even after looking at it, we wouldn't understand what it had done there exactly. So in fact, we're not keeping these things air gap. We're not keeping them off the internet. But even if we did, I would worry that they would hack the humans in contact with them instead of hacking into other computers. But are they smarter than us? Like, do because, but you know, they are certainly the systems are faster. They can handle trillions more in parallel. But is it smarter than us? Is that intelligence? Is that where the risk is coming from? Well, right now it's not smarter than us. But if it's not smarter than us, if we're not all dead, people will keep on improving the systems until they are smarter than us and everyone is dead. They're just going to keep on doing it. Does AI need to feel in order to turn against us? Not in any human sense, I think. It needs to be steering the future. It needs to be true about it that it acts in a way where it tries to steer the future in some places rather than others. A chess machine, which is not very much like GPT-4, but nonetheless, a chess playing AI doesn't feel about the board, but it is very effective at steering the board into spaces where it side won, right? It's, it's like steering the future without really wanting things. It just has a place that it steers. It has a preference. It, it has a utility function, but it doesn't have a desire. This is part of why I'm worried. Like, I'm, I'm worried that we're going to be wiped out by something that doesn't know happiness, sadness, surprise, surprised joy. I'm worried that we are not heading for a world of AIs that have feelings and care about each other's feelings sometimes, in, in which case it might not be so bad. I, I'm worried that we're heading for something that is more alien than that in, in a way where even with a very open-minded cosmopolitan attempting to embrace the diversity of the cosmos, we'd still think that it was pointless, that this, had, this was what had killed us. This has been eye-opening. And hopeful, actually. In a weird sort of way. Yeah, it has. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.